Well, welcome. This is uh, the voice of Mark Goring. I welcome you to the uh, SeaBuild online recorded workshop, Thinking Strategically About Patronage Dividend Decisions. Uh, Marilyn Show will be our main presenter tonight, and we're very pleased to have some invited guests to help tell the story about patronage dividends. We'll be using the online um, uh, question system from GoToWebinar, and we will have time at the end of the session to um, take your questions, and we'll do our best at answering them and or directing you to resources that we know exist um, that will help you. Uh, so with that, Marilyn, would you like to start us off? Sure will. Thank you, Mark, and hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, tonight, we'll we'll be looking at uh, the patronage dividend decisions. And first, we'll take a look at the outcome outline here for tonight's session. Uh, we'll start with introductions and review of the, of the workshop. And then we'll take a few minutes just to review co-op ownership and the basics of patronage dividends. We do have other webinars and resources on, on that topic in general. So we'll spend the bulk of our time looking at the annual patronage dividend decisions and then questions and discussion around those. Our session tonight is scheduled for one hour. We do have some guests tonight, and I'd like to welcome those guests and ask each of you to uh, just say hello and maybe a word or two so that uh, people can uh, connect your voice with your name. Uh, first, we have Claire Carpenter from Good Foods Co-op in Lexington, Kentucky. Hi, I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you, Claire. Uh, next, we have Dave from uh, the Seward Co-op in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, hi, I'm also uh, pleased to be here and look forward to listening to what you got to say. Glad you're here, Dave. And then Todd from the People's Co-op in Portland, Oregon, and also with CBS Consulting Co-op. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. And thank you all for coming, uh, especially the guests. Uh, I've asked the guests to comment in particular sections where it's relevant for their co-op but also if there are other sections where they uh, have some story to tell or examples from their co-op, uh, they'll be jumping in as well. Our outcomes for tonight are that our, all participants understand the benefits of the patronage dividend system, that uh, you understand the annual decisions that the board makes, and then the long-term implications of those decisions uh, for the strength and health of the co-op. And then lastly, our outcome is our, we hope that co-ops will make strategic patronage dividend decisions and will be stronger and better together as a result. Uh, just a quick note about the note. Um, I'm not an attorney or an accountant, although I've consulted with both in the preparation of these materials and they've reviewed the content. Uh, but it, it, it should be uh, understood that you will need to seek professional advice from accountants and lawyers for specific questions related to specific situations at your co-op. This will be an, a general review, and you should not rely on this for uh, your specific uh, decisions. Uh, with that, uh, let's begin to take a look at ownership. And this would be any type of ownership, not just in the cooperative structure, that owners have responsibilities uh, for any kind of business. One of those is um, providing capital to finance the business. Another is to make good decisions to provide guidance and direction to the co-op. Um, owners also benefit from the business that they own uh, through um, being able to control the economic results or surplus uh, from the business. After other, other debts and expenses are paid, the owners receive the excess. Now, cooperative ownership is a little bit unique. It adds some additional features, one being that members control the co-op on a democratic basis, one member, one vote, rather than on how much has been invested. Uh, further, um, and this is where patronage dividends becomes an important example, the member's share of the benefit is based on how much they shop, how much they use the co-op, not by how much they've invested, but by how much they use. In other words, the profit that is related to their actual purchases, their use of the co-op, is what each, uh, each owner has a share of. Uh, then through the elected board of directors, the member owners allocate surpluses for um, developing the co-op to meet their common needs. The graphic on, on this next uh, slide shows this 
difference between uh, the co-op ownership structure and other structures where in a sole proprietorship the owner owns and controls but the general public uses. In the middle, the difference in an investor-owned corporation that uh, stockholders own, board of directors control, and again, general public uses. And then in the bottom, the cooperative structure where all three roles are, are uh, controlled, are, are um, in the hands of the member owners. They, they own it, they provide the financing, they control it through their board of directors, and they use it through their shopping and patronage. So that's um, um, a unique in the ways that businesses are owned for those all to be true. It's um, important to assume that a, a co-op, uh, any kind of business needs capital. Um, you may not know today why you need capital, but when you need it, you will need it in a, uh, and you'll need it to be strategically available to you. What's true in the, in the last 18 months or so is that other uh, outside sources of capital have become harder and harder for businesses and for co-ops in particular to be able to uh, access. And so it becomes more important than ever for co-ops to be, look strategically at building capital through the use of patronage dividends. Uh, members invest in the co-op because they believe that it's in their own interest as well as in the interest of other members. So it's of course important for the co-op to be able to earn that trust by being sure that you are operating in their interest, being an efficient agent for what it is the members want and need, and for the members to understand that, to perceive it, to have a sense of the co-op uh, existing to serve their needs. In, in our case, the co-op exists often to serve the need of access to food that we wouldn't have available otherwise, locally, uh, locally produced products, high quality products, organic and natural foods um, at a fair and reasonable price. So whatever it is that the, the co-op is, your co-op is offering to your members, you'll need capital in order to do that, and a portion of that capital will come from the members. So that's where the, why the capital comes from. Then let's look at why patronage refunds is a good way to organize your co-op. Uh, certainly, it creates a mutually beneficial relationship with the owners, so that the better the co-op does, the better the owners do, and the more the owners shop, the better the co-op does. So that mutually uh, beneficial relationship really encourages both membership and member investment. It builds trust and it engages people as owners. They begin to understand their role, not just as shoppers, but as owners of the co-op. Patronage dividends is a cooperative advantage. It's been a part of the cooperative movement since the beginning in the 1800s in England and has continued to this day. It's built into the, the tax code, the Internal Revenue Service Code of the United States and other countries as well. Uh, the, Cooperative advantage, uh, the patronage dividends allows the cooperative to build capital, to have resources available when they'll need them for future opportunities, keeps more money in the local community, uh, reduces cash and increases um, the, it, it reduces cash outlay and increases the cash available to the co-op and saves the co-op taxes. And lastly, a good benefit is it creates an appropriate pressure for the co-op to be profitable. Uh, we know that the co-op wouldn't be able to stay in business if it didn't uh, operate profitably, and uh, patronage dividends help support that. So let's talk a little bit about how uh, patronage dividends work. The uh, IRS code is fairly simple. There's only five sections, um, but it's important to follow the, them precisely. And you'll, again, want to work with uh, professional uh, legal and accounting help to be sure that you understand and follow the rules carefully. Uh, one part of the code is a requirement that the business operates on a cooperative basis. Um, so that that means that it is owned and controlled, and the benefits belong, the surplus belongs to the members, as we discussed earlier, in the cooperative ownership system. For consumer co-ops, if at least 85% of your gross receipts are, 
for personal living or family use, uh, then you can uh, file the form that's mentioned here, 3491, and then the, uh, there's no need to issue a 1099 to every member. Uh, and further, for most of your members, their patronage dividend will not be taxable to them. Now, there will be some exceptions for members who are purchasing not for their personal or family or living use, but purchasing for business use, like a, a daycare center or a, a bakery that might purchase some products from your co-op. If it's a business expense, then the dividend would be deductible. But for most members, it is not, and there will be no tax obligation for them. Another part of the IRS code is that there must be a pre-existing condition. And uh, usually that uh, ex obligation is written in the co-op's bylaws. And that uh, lets the IRS know and lets the members know that the co-op intends that it's operating for the benefit of its members not for the purpose of generating a profit, and the profit that belongs, the profit that is generated uh, belongs to the members and will either be returned to them or retained and used by the co-op to benefit those members through uh, services and creating value that the members want. Again, uh, patronage dividends is uh, based on the, the net earnings of the co-op and most co-ops, uh, this is only, uh, use it only on earnings to members. Um, the IRS doesn't specify that. It would allow it, if you were operating on a cooperative basis, it would allow you to deduct um, earnings and, and distribute, allocate earnings to non-members. But most co-ops don't. Most co-ops, um, the first uh, activity at the end of the year is to make a calculation of which of the, uh, which, what amount of the net income is eligible for distribution. And as this slide points out, in most cases, that is the member patronage, uh, the income that is a result of the patronage from members. So that's simply a calculation. If it's done in the bookkeeping department, how much of our patronage dividends are eligible uh, sorry, how much of our net income is eligible to be allocated to members. Now, I'm going to pause here just for a minute and, and talk about the difference between allocation and distribution. Allocation is a bookkeeping uh, step. It's, it's allocating, moving on the books from uh, general profits, allocating that to individual members in individual member accounts. Uh, that's the allocation. The distribution is uh, the function of moving that cash from the co-op to the member. So the, the first step, again, at the top, net income, is, is uh, calculated how much is member source net income. Then uh, in the colored boxes, there are two choices. The yellow box shows uh, the amount that could be allocated to member owners of the member patronage net income, some of it could be allocated to member owners, others of it could be unallocated, not credited to any um, individual member, and the co-op would pay taxes on those, just like the co-op pays taxes on the uh, earnings from non-members. So that's a choice, and that's the first decision. We'll go into a little more detail about that in a bit. Then of the amount of profit that the board decides to allocate, the next decision is how much of that shall we distribute. The IRS requires a minimum distribution of 20 percent. So you must distribute at least 20 percent. You may retain the rest, the maximum of 80 percent. And we'll, again, that will come back to that in a little bit to describe uh, how you would make that decision. The amount that's deferred then stays in the co-op as retained earnings. It becomes equity capital for the co-op for the, uh, just like the either unallocated or retained earnings stays in the co-op as equity capital. Uh, those two sources have been taxed first. The retained portion 
of the member's allocation is untaxed building the co-op's equity capital. OK, um, then just a brief recap of the benefits of patronage uh, refunds, and then we'll move right through uh, to those decisions. Uh, uh, really, for the co-op, it's that they are they're flexible, that you can uh, vary the decision on an annual basis based on what's the condition of the co-op in that year and based on what are the strategic needs of the co-op in that year. Unlike other kinds of benefit programs that are not flexible, that have, um, for example, formerly a lot of co-ops used a discount structure. Those were discounts that were given before the end of the year, before a co-op knew if it had profits or not was not a flexible system and caused uh, quite a bit of trouble. And uh, co-ops that have um, still used that system might find that it will, will really be wise to switch to a system that will allow you to have a flexible benefit structure. It's also sustainable. It will Patronage dividends is a benefit that will work for the co-op. Uh, whatever the percentage of sales to members are, however the co-op grows, it's a sustainable system. It builds capital, and it lowers taxes. A lot of good news there. And for the members, the benefits of patronage dividends are also true, uh, that they provide a fair return on the member's investment. They, they can be applied to a share purchase. If you have a, a purchase plan for your capital structure, uh, then the member can use their um, distributed portion of their uh, re retained, uh, sorry, the distributed por portion of their patronage dividends to make their their payments on their sh on their share plan. Uh, they have, as we talked about before, there's no tax implications as long as the uh, uh, purchases were made for their personal use, and it really engages them in the uh, co-op and uh, uh, helps them understand their role as owners. I'm going to talk a little bit about other kinds of member benefits and how patronage dividends fit in. Um, because patronage dividends are delayed, they don't happen until the end of the year. They're uncertain. We don't know if the co-op will be profitable or not. There may be none. Uh, there may be no benefit from patronage dividends. And variable, that we can't tell the members at the beginning of the year how much the co-op will profit. We don't know yet. Uh, so be because of those reasons, patronage dividends should be supplemented by other more immediate, more tangible benefits, such as the ones listed here, member coupons, member-only sales and specials, et cetera. Um, generally, those are management decisions, uh, but the board can encourage management to think about and be sure that management understands they have the authority to uh, identify and to encourage people to join and to show the appreciation for them being a member through other kinds of benefits. Uh, patronage dividends are a part of it, but they uh, probably would not be very effective as the only uh, benefit to members because of their delayed, uncertain, and variable nature. Uh, Claire, I think this would be a good place for you to talk a little bit about uh, Good Foods Co-op in Lexington and, and what your member owner benefits are. Sure. Um, well, we don't issue store coupons uh, of our own, but we certainly enjoyed um, the, the coupons that we get through NCGA, the Co-op Advantage coupons that come to us every couple months. Um, we do um, uh, special sales. Um, we have truck sales, although I believe those are actually a benefit for shoppers as well uh, and not just owners. We do those uh, several times a year. Um, we have member appreciation days, which uh, uh, we started that phrase uh, in our co-op some years ago called the MAD days, M-A-D, uh, for member appreciation days. And then when we started calling our owners owners instead of members, uh, we now call them owner discount days. So they're odd days. Uh, <laughs> and we publicize them that way. But, but people get a kick out of that. Uh, we certainly uh, allow and encourage special orders. Um, and we have uh, bulk discounts for a number of different things. Um, and our uh, owner services department definitely uh, offers special prices on some of our classes and um, various other 
other things that um, owners can benefit from. So we, we do practically all of those things in one way or another. Nice, thank you. And, and are those management, uh, management decides on those? Yes, they do. Our general manager, Ann Hopkins, um, sets all those out and um, it's the staff that, and management that determine um, the amount of, of the benefit, the, uh, the level of discount and so on. Good, I think that's a good choice. Good, so that the, the, while the manager decides on those uh, other kinds of owner benefits, the board uh, typically has the responsibility of deciding, making the annual decisions for uh, patronage dividends. And while we do call those annual decisions, they are decisions that you make once a year, it's really helpful if you think of those in, in a longer term context. How do they fit in to the co-op's long-range plan? Um, once the co-op has an idea of, of what it is you're trying to accomplish in the world, what difference do you want to make in people's lives? What are your goals? What is it that, that you could do that would benefit your members and your community? Uh, then it becomes easier to see the patronage dividend decisions as a part of the, the longer-term vision as a way of how can we use patronage dividends as a tool to help us accomplish our longer-term goals? So again, they are annual decisions, but it's important to think about them strategically. Those good annual decisions will lead to the co-op having a stronger balance sheet, which will give you the ability to take advantage of opportunities when they arise or ones that you're planning for some point in the future. We'll build capital in the co-op will lower your taxes, and will create satisfied and loyal member owners. So let's take a look at the decisions one at a time. Uh, the first one, again, is how much of the eligible profits will be allocated. So the first step, again, is a calculation. Most co-ops do restrict the allocation to members only, and so you'll just want to know that number first. Um, obviously, the more sales you have to members, the more of your profits that then you can allocate in patronage dividend use to reduce your taxes and to increase your capital. So it becomes a real incentive for building membership. And uh, I'll call on Dave in just a minute to ask him to uh, tell us a little bit about um, an innovative program they use in the Twin Cities to increase sales to members. But as you're looking at the decision of how much to allocate, you want to look at uh, the cash reserves. Uh, many, many state laws allow you to set aside a portion, even though you have this pre-existing condition that the profits belong to the members, the law does allow you to set aside a portion if you need or want to, to hold in reserve. Now those will be taxed, so you'll want to make that decision uh, carefully and be sure that the tax implications are not greater than the patronage dividend um, implications as far as cash goes. Another consideration is the tax implication. Uh, sometimes co-ops have other tax deductions that are more valuable to you than the patronage dividends. And if so, you may want to talk with your accountant about the uh, strategic possibilities of of uh, setting aside a higher amount in reserve and using those other tax deductions and uh, saving the, the taxes that way rather than, than uh, having to allocate and distrib distribute the 20%. In any case, be sure that you do follow the tax rules, the state statutes, and the co-op's own bylaws. From our point of view, unless there's a compelling reason not to, we recommend allocating 100% of your eligible profits for patronage dividends. For most co-ops, if you want a little cash reserve on an annual basis, the, the profits on sales to non-members will give you that cash reserve. It'll still be taxable, and then you can take the maximum tax deduction from the sales to members and allocate it uh, to patronage dividends. But again, that's not if, if there's another reason, um, certainly take that into consideration. 
Uh, Dave, you want to tell us a, a little bit about how the Twin Cities co-ops have worked together to uh, increase sales to members? Well, yeah, the Twin Cities is a, a pretty special place for co-ops, and we're lucky that there's a, a vibrant co-op community here. Uh, at Seward, typically we have about 70% of our sales are to members. And, and one way that we boost that a little bit is we are members in all the other co-ops in, in town. And when their members shop in our store, they um, count, we count their membership and they get to get all of our member specials, et cetera. Um, it gets booked as a sale to the co-op that they're from. So if a Wedge member who's not a member of our co-op shops in our store, they just say they're from the Wedge. We track all the Wedge shoppers and send the Wedge a patronage de uh, dividend every year. We do that for Lake Winds and Mississippi Market. And they do the same for us, so we just essentially pool the sales that way. Increases our, our sales to members, and uh, it works out pretty well for everybody. I bet it also feels real friendly to the other co-ops that when they, uh, for shoppers, when they shop at a different co-op to be able to uh, be treated as, as a member because they're a member of a different co-op. It certainly does, and you know it's nice for our members to be able to go to other places. And we do actually have quite a few people in the cities who are members in multiple co-ops, so they they get the the benefits wherever they go, which is nice. Now that particular strategy may not work for every co-op community, but I think it's just uh, it's just a great example of how to think strategically about um, building your sales to members so that you, you can take the greatest advantage possible. Of course, just growing your membership is, is certainly a, a key way of doing that, and the member owner benefits that we talked about and that Claire mentioned are good tools for that. So thank you, Dave, for another example of how that could happen. So again, unless there's an, a reason not to, we recommend um, allocating 100% of eligible profits to patronage dividends. Now let's look at the second decision that a board has to make. Once you've decided on the amount, your next decision is what percentage of those allocated profits will we distribute? Now remember, the IRS requires a minimum of 20% to be distributed. The rest can be retained, and the co-op gets the tax advantage of the full amount, both the paid out and the retained portion. So somewhere between distributing 20% and up to 100%, you could distribute that much if you wish, um, the, the board will need to make a decision. So what should you think about when you make that decision? Well, certainly, as we've talked about so far, one important thing to think about is how, how can we build capital? What about our cash needs? Do we have a lot of debt that we're going to need to be repaying? Would we need excess capital for that? Would we need cash? What about capital investment opportunities? Are there things that we could do if we had the cash, if we had capital to do them with? Are there services that our members would like? Do they have needs and expectations that we could serve if we could reinvest in the co-op, either in the store or in other activities? Uh, more stores, expanded stores, other kinds of uh, operations that would be of benefit to the members. What might we want to do? For those, you'd need a strong balance sheet. So all of those kind of building capital needs would suggest that you would distribute the minimum and retain the rest up to 80% and use that in the member's interest on their behalf to better serve and meet their needs through a stronger co-op. Another consideration is what is a fair return to members? Remember that the members have contributed some equity amount. Um, for food co-ops, it tends to vary between, um, a, a, on the low end, probably 50 or $60, on the high end to several hundred dollars. And uh, that money is, is theirs as long as they're a member. Uh, the co-op is using it. Um, as long as things are going well, that'd be returned to them when they leave the co-op. But still, you're using their money, and 
uh, they could be doing something else with it. So what would be a fair return for them? So one way that some boards think about that is what would the member earn on that money if they, if they put it somewhere else instead of in the co-op? What if they put it in a, a savings account? What if they put it in the stock market? Um, what could they earn on, on their $100 investment that, that we're using while they're a member? And that just gives a way of thinking about what might be a fair return. They're still, the $100 is still theirs, but what is your yearly use of it worth? So the 20%, uh, distributing the 20% turns out to, for most members, to be a very fair return. On average, if a, if a member spent about $100 a week on groceries at the co-op and the co-op earned a 2% profit and decided to distribute 20% uh, of that, then that member would get a check for about $20. So you can see that if their equity was $100, that would be a 20% return. That's that's a pretty high return on their investment at 20%. Um, it would take them only five years to have doubled their investment to have earned back another $100 in addition to the $100 that they still have invested. Of course, that won't be true for every member. Members who shop less will get a less amount. And uh, so it's a nice uh, way to talk to members about the benefit. Uh, hey, if you want a bigger check at the end of the year, shop more, uh, spend more of your dollars at the co-op, and uh, tell the story about the, the shoppers who do spend a high portion of their dollars at the co-op and are getting a patronage dividend checks at the 20% amount. Uh, could be as much as uh, um, 50, 60, 70, uh, even $100 uh, for your largest shoppers at the 20% distribution amount. So think about what is a fair return um, in addition to what builds capital. And then, of course, as always, follow the tax rules, the state statutes, and the bylaws. Uh, we recommend distributing the minimum amount, 20%, unless there's some real compelling reason for distributing more. Uh, strengthen the co-op. Um, build capital. Get the maximum amount of tax benefit and pool the, the resources in the member's interest. The difference between thinking about a short-term short -term return uh, versus a long-term investment, um, really creating the, the kind of cooperative uh, community and economic vitality that, that co-ops can create in your community if you have the capital available to do it with. Uh, so that's decision number two. Uh, I guess I want to pause here and just see if, if any of our guests have a comment that they would like to make on this uh, on the second decision. Dave or Todd or Claire? Marilyn, I, I liked, uh, this is Todd, I liked what you said about pooling the uh, monies and the interests of the member owners. Uh, one of the one of the ways that I've seen this decision looked at is uh, a, a, a choice between giving it to the member owners and not giving it to the member owners. And I think that's problematic, obviously. Uh, because really, I mean, the way we started to try to talk about this was to consider that uh, distribution, uh, whatever percentage we distribute, uh, some of it is would be going back say 20% to the member owners uh, immediately, but the rest is also being pooled, as you say, for the member owners in the long term. So it's not an either or kind of thing. It's, it's all meant to benefit uh, our community and our member owners in some fashion. Good. Thank you, Todd. That's a, a nice way of thinking about it. Um, some of the co-ops that have been uh, thinking strategically about patronage dividends for some time have pooled a, a fairly substantial amount of money. Uh, one co-op in particular has over $5 million now in retained patronage dividends. Those are dividends that they've been retaining over um, about 15 years. And uh, that money has been put to work for their members. They were able to, to buy a farm. Uh, they own a, a distribution a company where they're able to distribute local product to other co-ops in their region. 
they have an online home store where people can uh, make, make purchases of, of cooperative, um, cooperatively produced and natural and organic uh, um, household items through their online store. And so there's a, a lot of uh, opportunity that can happen if the co-op has the capital to and the vision uh, to be able to think more broadly about what their members might need and how they might be able to serve those needs with additional capital. Any other comments from the other uh, panelists here today? I, I, this is Dave from Seward, Minneapolis. I think just to second the, the long-term view, especially on the, the board, it's really our role to, to think long-term, and this is a really important part of, part of thinking about that strategically. Thanks, Dave. This is Claire, um, and I'd like to underscore what Todd was saying. I really like the phrase of, of commonwealth, um, and I think that's something that we might uh, use more often when we talk about the benefits of uh, patronage rebates. Yes, good. It's a good phrase. Thank you all. Well, let's move on to the third decision that a board has to make annually, and that is the method of distribution. So however much you, you distribute, again, we recommend 20, uh, but however much um, that you decide to distribute um, must be paid in cash, or in some states it can be paid with a store credit if uh, and this is a provision that's specific in the IRS code, if the members have the option to redeem that for cash. So if you offer them a store credit and they would prefer cash, you just have to make that possible for them to, to receive it in cash. Um, but the considerations are, uh, what will encourage use? Unfortunately, many members don't yet understand patronage dividends, and they think, that if they get us a small check for five or ten dollars or um, whatever, that maybe they're helping the co-op out if they don't cash it. Well, it's actually not true. It hurts the co-op because the full amount of that distribution, if they don't cash the check, the full amount is no longer deductible from the co-op's taxes, and so the co-op will, oh, the member will not get the benefit of either the cash portion or the allocated portion. All of that will return back to retained earnings and be taxable for the co-op. That will be adjusted in the next tax year, and so it really is important to find a method that will encourage use. And the store credit um, tends to encourage use, especially if you can keep track of it in your cash register system, so that you can tell the member uh, when they check out that I see you have a, a store credit here from your patronage dividend of, of four dollars or six dollars or however much it is, would you like to use that today? And that becomes um, um, a way that you can begin the conversation with the member. And, and then if they say, well, no, I thought I would just contribute that, uh, you can also have a fund set up where you can say, well, let's, would you like to contribute it to the food bank yeah, all of, all of the, or some other organization in your town that if a member doesn't want to use their benefit, would they like to donate it? Uh, if it's the member's choice to donate it, then the co-op still receives the tax deduction from the entire amount of the distribution. Now, even if you do it, do it as a store credit, you still have to deliver to each person a notification of the full amount of their allocation. So there won't be any savings in terms of uh, postage or mailing or printing of um, of the letters, there will be a savings of printing checks, but you will still need to mail or in some way uh, ensure that all members receive their notification. Again, that's a, a very specific in the IRS rules. They must receive their notification of the full amount with their, uh, with their distributed portion. So you can mail them a letter, tell them uh, how much their allocation is, how much of that is distributed, and how they can collect that next time they go shopping. Um, again, on this decision, uh, we recommend issuing store credit if it's allowed in your state. Not all states allow the issuing of, of store credit. So be sure and, and know both the, the federal law does allow it, some states do not allow it. So be sure and, and check with an attorney or an accountant who's familiar with the laws in your particular state. 
So that's decision number three. Looking at decision number four, um, what is the minimum amount of distribution? Um, the co-op can set a minimum amount and decide not to process any amounts that will be less than a certain amount. Um, and you get to decide what that amount is, knowing, of course, that the co-op will have to pay taxes on the members, on the income from those members that would have received that small amount of uh, distribution. So the way to think about it is to compare kind of the cost of preparing and mailing checks uh, or the all allocation notifications with the benefit uh, to the co-op and to the member. Uh, generally, uh, what, what I see and, and what I recommend is that co-ops set that minimum distribution amount somewhere between two and five dollars. Like much less than two dollars, it becomes somewhat costly to, to make that allocation and make the distribution, and many of those aren't cashed or used anyway. Uh, but anything over five dollars is valuable enough, both from a, to the member and to the co-op, that I think uh, you wouldn't want to set it any higher than that amount. Let's take a look now at, a, at an example of how uh, this can work with some specific numbers. Um, in the first column, the kind of uh, brownish-orange column would be if there was no patronage distribution, that the co-op has $100,000 in taxable income. Then the next two columns, the green columns, show a different scenario. Uh, what if this is a co-op that is going to distribute uh, patronage dividends? Um, by the way, I use patronage dividend and patronage refund interchangeably. Um, if either uh, work and either are appropriate for a consumer co-op. Different kinds of co-ops don't have the flexibility of using either. But because uh, for consumer co-ops where it's a refund on purchases, either refund or dividend is an appropriate terminology for your co-op. So back to the table. Um, in the green column there, uh, we'll walk through the, the difference in compared to the, the brown column. In, in the green column, a patronage dividend, that first action of sorting how much of the sales, uh, how much of the profit is based on member sales and how much is based on non-member sales. And so in this case, 75% of the sales were to members, so 75% of the profits were from member sales, and those that was the amount of profit that could be allocated. The profit on non-member sales is taxable. In this case, we're assuming a 15% uh, tax on that $25,000. So a tax of uh, 3750 For the uh, non-patronage dividend in the brown column there, we're assuming a higher tax uh, bracket on that higher profit amount of 22.5% uh, on $100,000. And so you can see uh, right off the, the huge difference in the amount of taxes that are paid. For the uh, patronage dividend co-op, paid taxes of $3,750. The uh, non-patronage dividend uh, co-op paid $22,000. Now, even if we'd use the same t uh, percentage of tax assumption, uh, say 15% tax, uh, it would still be uh, greater than a $10,000 difference in tax saving for the co-op by using the patronage dividend distribution. And the next line there looks at the 20% that has to be paid in cash. Well, this is another one of the decision points, decision number two. And in this example, we're looking at a, a co-op that did make the follow the recommendation of the 20% minimum. So of the 75,000 in profits that were allocated to members, 20% uh, will be distributed, and that comes to $15,000. For the ones where there was no patronage allocation, of course, that column is blank. There's no, no cash paid out. 
then we add those columns together to look at what would the total cash outlay be? What's the cash benefit to the co-op? So for the non-patronage refund allocation, their cash outlay was their taxes. They didn't have to pay out anything to members. It was 22.5. For the um, patronage refund allocation, uh, the tax outlay in this example is 18,750. So there is a, about a $4,000 cash advantage for the co-op that made the distribution. Looking at those, sub subtracting those from the total there, um, there's that difference. But look at the difference in how much of that cash stays in the community. And particularly for co-ops that uh, issue their, their cash distribution in terms of store credit, that's money that not only stays in the community, but that's money that's used at the store to purchase more food. So it's really recycling a much higher percentage of dollars within the co-op itself. Um, we'll move on from this for now with, and, and summarize the recommendations. Unless there is a compelling reason not to, we recommend allocating 100% of eligible profits for patronage dividends, distributing the minimum 20%, and retaining 80% to reinvest for the common good. Issue the distribution through store credits and set a minimum distribution amount of between 2 and 5%. So Todd, I wanted to ask if at this point you would uh, talk a little bit about the, the uh, way that your co-op is thinking about these, these decisions and kind of the paradigm shift that your co-op is, is going through as you kind of grapple with the issues here. Certainly. Um, well, uh, so at Peoples in Portland, uh, we've had a patronage dividend system in place for about three years. And for also about that same amount of time, we have ambitious and vibrant ends for our co-op, things that we know we want to achieve as a co-op. And yet, as a board, uh, strangely enough, uh, we've only recently begun to think about the patronage dividend decision in a strategic and forward-thinking uh, kind of way, like, like we're talking about today. Um, and in the previous years, decisions were made with an emphasis on the building of short-term member goodwill, certainly not a bad thing, um, but without a good sense of the long-term impact of those decisions over time. So an aha moment for us as a board was when we laid out what those uh, patrons refund decisions looked like over a trend line, we visually and try to tell a story about what that trend line meant to us, what it looked like. And so that was a way for us to kind of wrap our head around this idea of thinking about these decisions and what they mean over time. Um, and so this year, we started to make a cultural shift on our board and start approaching this question from a more strategic viewpoint, considering uh, that, again, I mean, I think this, this was said before, but it's worth repeating, there is a value in amassing capital, uh, capital that will enable us to be a greater agent for the positive kind of transformation that we want to make in our community. Um, Claire talked about it as, as uh, sort of community wealth, a collective wealth. Um, it's a powerful concept for, I think, boards to wrap their heads around. Um, also, uh, in relation to that is the ability for, uh, that we thought of to effectively communicate the story uh, of that benefit to the member owners of why it's important to build this community wealth, um, and especially how that wealth is connected with our ends and our continuing relevance in our community. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, and this was something that our directors again had to come to terms with, is that uh, the positivity of building capital even if it's not necessarily connected with a specific project. Some of our directors had questions, well, why would we build capital if we don't actually know uh, a specific project that that's going to be attached to? Um, and yet, uh, thinking about long-term goals, uh, 
it seems perfectly wonderful to not know yet exactly what a specific project will be, but know that we have a process for uh, figuring that out, for getting to understand better the long-term needs of our members. And uh, again, quite frankly, that we know, we absolutely know that we want to do great things in the future, and that's going to require capital. Mm -hmm. um, one director sort of related it to, you know, the question of when you start saving for college, uh, not, w not when you know which specific college you want to go to, but when you have an inkling that someday you may want to go there. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, Ted. Yeah. It's uh, very helpful to be able to put it into the longer term context like that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Very helpful. Um, well, I want. Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead, Todd. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to make one more point. Is that um, for us as a board, it, I don't think it was a super easy conversation to have. Um, like all kind of cultural shifts, it took a uh, commitment to developing a dialogue where we could where we could talk about this kind of thing. And uh, the Waking the Sleeping Giant article in Cooperative Grocer was really key uh, for flipping some switches in people's minds. Uh, it was really, really helpful. Also, uh, Gar Aparowitz's uh, 2006 talk at Weaver's Wake Co-op, directors uh, viewing that was really, really, really uh, helpful for us. And just creating a space for being able to talk about these kind of things and asking questions about you know, creating a, a cooperative uh, development culture at people's, what does it mean? How do we begin to, to talk about it and create it? Good. And thank you for mentioning the article. That's uh, really what I wanted to go to next, which, which was to uh, let people know about a new resource that's now available. It just came out in the last two weeks. It's called Patronage Dividends for Food Co-ops, a primer for distributing earnings and building member capital. And it, the contents are listed there. Uh, most of the contents were previously published articles in Cooperative Grocer, but we packaged them all together so it would be a handy resource for people to have the total of a 36-page document. And it includes some examples there of, uh, from other co-ops of how they communicate to members, and one from the Lexington Co-op, uh, the, their plan for changing from discounts to dividends and how they um, communicated that with members and how they developed other member benefits to supplement the patronage dividends and how they made their decisions in the first year of making patronage dividends. So there's a lot of uh, good tools there in that uh, reader and I hope that you'll um, have a chance to download it. It's uh, free for download. It's made, uh, it's in a PDF format so it's uh, easy to print if you'd like to you like to work that way, if you like to work on screen, it's easy for that as well. Um, we are um, coming up on the end. We do have some time for questions and some time for um, the panelists to make additional comments if they would wish. Um, and so, um, Mark, I'll let you uh, facilitate that. Yeah, great. And just want to remind people, uh, if they do want to uh, slide a quick question in here in the end, uh, use the GoToWebinar written interface and send it in. We do have a couple questions. Um, uh, one is, is, Marilyn, just roughly if you know how many co-ops are, are using the patronage dividend system, is it something that we're, that we're keeping track of and can, can answer? Uh, no, we don't have uh, real good data yet to be able to answer that. My guess is that it's somewhere between uh, 40 and 60 percent, but um, that's really um, a guess. It's something that I hope to track over the next year or two. It's a, it's a great question. Great. Uh, just a quick comment to Gail. Gail, I'm sorry you're having trouble writing in your question. Good luck with that. A um, uh, question maybe uh, to uh, you, Marilyn, or Dave, if you know. Do the, um, does the Twin Cities Area Co-op uh, setup require uh, giving 1099s to the member co-ops? I, I don't know the answer to that. Dave, do you? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, no. Yeah, kind of a, it's interesting. Uh, so that would be a technical question. Uh, um, and maybe we can get an answer for you and, and let you know. Um, My hunch would be no, because it's a, it's a pass-through. 
uh, it still is purchases that were uh, the other co-op didn't make the purchase the members of the other co-op made the purchase and they made those purchases for their personal use so my hunch is no uh, but we would need to get be sure and get um, an accountant's opinion on that and then um, there's a, a comment, not really a question, but the um, comment made that in that kind of Twin Cities uh, regional uh, setup that uh, possibly you could have a regional alliance organization that was uh, benefiting by receiving the patronage dividend um, distribution. So yes, I think that would be an opportunity as well. In the Twin Cities case, they go to the various co-ops, but I think there could also be another an association that all the co-ops were uh, that would that was a member of all the co-ops so that that would be another way of uh, pooling the revenue and the people's interest mm -hmm. good um, Marilyn here's a, uh, a governance uh, based question um, how would this look how would this process look in, uh, in in policy for board how would it write it up mm -hmm. yeah a good question um, I, I think there's a variety of ways. Some boards that I work with have a policy that requires their general manager to inform the board on an annual basis uh, about what the um, decisions uh, that are ready to be made and what the manager's recommendation for those decisions are. In other words, they, the, the board asks the manager uh, to not leave the board uninformed about the decisions and the manager's recommendation. Uh, so that's um, one way that I've seen the policy, uh, the, the impact on the policy register. That's uh, something that I might ask um, the, our three panelists to see if their, uh, if their policies address uh, patronage dividends in any way. This is Dave from Seward. Our policies don't specifically address patronage refund, but we do have the the policy you, you just stated. We expect the GM to make recommendations to us that uh, we usually listen to. Uh -huh. um, uh, Claire, we don't have anything uh, specific at our co-op, but I think we probably will be moving in the direction of putting some of this into a policy or two. And this is Todd. Uh, it's same thing with Claire. We don't have anything specifically outlined in the register, but we're giving it serious consideration. And I believe the C-Build uh, policy template has some examples that you can find those in the C-Build library. Right. Yeah, and what I recall there is it's based on the, the timely uh, recommendations and presentation of information. It seems like if the board uh, took these recommendations seriously, it might have a series of discussions and communications with members and would even consider controlling uh, at a higher level and a more specific level and say, unless there's a compelling reason, you know, we expect the recommendation to, you know, uh, retain the maximum amount. I mean, that would be the very specific policy. I have another question um, regarding uh, first time for retaining the maximum amount or the 80 percent. Is that uh, um, something that members, you know, seem to comment on or resist, or is there any way for us to comment on on just that experience that clubs have the first time around? Well, it certainly depends on the education that the co-op um, provides to its members and the information, and also the expectations that you create. Um, if you are uh, creating reasonable expectations from the beginning and letting people know that um, patronage dividend is a part of a greater pool of benefits that the co-op is using both for long-term planning and for tax savings, uh, then I think no, uh, the co-ops that have done a good job of communicating uh, really have not had any resistance. The, the materials that are in the patronage uh, dividend uh, primer that we talked about a minute ago uh, has examples from the Lexington Co-op, and they uh, they've experienced uh, quite a bit of uh, positive reinforcement from their members, who are very excited about the new package of benefits, find them more meaningful than the benefits they had before, and are pleased to see the co-op uh, building and planning for the long-term future. So that that communication plan will give you some ideas about the way to tell the story. How about that? I can comment from Good Foods. Uh, we did a survey monkey survey of our owners, 
and overwhelmingly, like 90% plus, said keep the money. Good. And this is Dave from Seward. We haven't formally pulled the members, but we've been doing the 80-20 split since I've been on the board about seven years, and it's, it's been positively received and, and almost no controversy about it whatsoever. First, one thing to keep in mind that it's easier to, to start at the minimum. You could always raise it later, uh, but if you start higher, then you kind of have set an expectation, and then people may feel like you're taking something away in another year if you develop a different plan. So it's certainly easier, I think, to start at the, at the minimum um, as long as you've created that expectation, communicated clearly about why, you're, why the co-op is doing what they're doing. And you think about it, what other local business returns 20% of the profit it earns on the shopping that you do there? I mean, it's I amazing, really. And on that note, Marilyn, I'd just like to say thank you very much. And just take a quick uh, look here at your desired outcomes for the beginning of the session. I think that you, that you certainly covered the material well and uh, encourage all of the attendees to uh, take this topic seriously and, and take the conversation out into your co-ops and spread, spread the word. Um, thank you, Marilyn, for, for the show. And thank you, uh, Todd and Claire and Dave, for coming on. Your stories and voices were, were very helpful tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thanks, everybody. I sure appreciate you all coming. Yeah. And uh, finally, this, uh, this workshop will be po posted in the, in the library um, uh, tomorrow, possibly. So uh, you can send the link out to uh, folks on your boards that, that weren't, weren't able to.